Hi, Celia, Sue, thank you very much for joining us. Um, can you, I ask you to start by just introducing yourselves and saying a bit about what you did around your marriage? Okay, so I'm Celia Kitzinger and I'm Sue Wilkinson. And um, we were married in Canada in 2003. Uh, we're both British citizens. I just happened to be working in Canada at the time when it became legal for same-sex couples to marry. So we did. And uh, when we came back to England, back home again permanently, we were told our marriage would not be recognised. And then when the Civil Partnership Act came in, a couple of years later, we were told our marriage would be deemed a civil partnership. And that wasn't acceptable to us because we figured, well, we'd contracted a marriage. If we'd been a man and a woman getting married in Canada, coming back to England, of course that marriage would have been recognized as such. So it seemed it was discriminatory simply on the grounds that we were two women. So we took our case to the High Court to have our marriage recognised as a marriage in our home country and not have it deemed as a civil partnership instead. And obviously one of the one thing you were doing was challenging the law. You were challenging the whole legislation around marriage and civil partnerships. But you also, and I think very successfully, provoked a public debate and challenged public discourse. Can you focus for me on, on what it was you were trying to communicate when you thought about the kind of public discussion you were provoking? I, I think for me, I was very aware of the difference in the public discussion at the time between what was going on in England and what was going on in Canada. So I was whipping across between countries and the, the message in England at the time was, we want civil partnerships. Isn't it great? We're going to get a special gay institution just for us that will give us rights and benefits and we don't want marriage anyway it's heteropatriarchal it's old-fashioned it's a, it's oppressive of women and it's a religious symbol but we're going to get civil partnerships and that's fantastic so that was what i was hearing when i was in england when i would travel to canada to be with sue in canada the equivalent what were they called domestic registered domestic partnerships registered domestic partnerships were refused by the canadian gay movement they said that was um, a, a, a different institution, it was second class, it was separate is not equal, was the big slogan, building on the um, civil rights movement. And so I, I guess I had access to a way of thinking in human rights terms, rather than simply in gay liberation terms, about what marriage meant and that it was, a, it was about equality and it was about access to the same institution that heterosexual or different sex couples had rights to. And that for me was the, the strongest message I wanted to get across. It didn't matter what you thought about marriage. It didn't matter whether you thought it was a great institution or oppressive. It was like the army, another institution I'm not very keen on. If straight people have the right to go into that institution, so should gay people. And for me, that was the most compelling message. It was a message about equality. Yeah, and I think one of the things that happened was that because we were married in Canada and saw how the campaigns had played out there, we had very much an international perspective um, that people in, in Britain didn't seem to have at the time. So we noticed that um, the Canadian campaigners were drawing, for example, on what had happened in South Africa. Mm. Um, which was one of the first countries to introduce marriage equality. Um, as Celia said, they were drawing yeah. on civil liberties discourses. So I remember one of the Canadian advertisements that was um, challenging civil partnerships was two water coolers next to each other, one labelled straight and one labelled gay, with the slogan, um, if this isn't all right for black people and white people, why is it all right for gay people and straight people? So that was explicitly drawing on the separate is not equal civil rights discourse. But it, it felt very much like an uphill challenge to get that message across mm. back in England. Um, there wasn't that kind of cultural awareness and um, it was very much the case that civil partnerships were seen as a huge step forward 
which in, mm. in some ways they were. I mean, they gave a lot of rights to lesbian and gay couples that they hadn't previously had, um, but at the expense of, of true equality. Was having the back of, backing of liberty important for pushing for the more human rights? Absolutely. I mean, we couldn't have done what we did without the backing of two organisations. Liberty was the one, um, the National Human Rights and Civil Liberties Organisation, and they provided free legal advice and representation and lots of sort of formal advice on how to, to take the case forward. And, and also a sort of aura of respectability and sort of central placing our struggle in the center of human rights issues which yeah. I think so, so having their backing was symbolically important in yeah. that, in that yeah. sense but equally important was having the backing of outrage through Peter Tatchell because we really wanted to stay connected with the grassroots lesbian and gay movements mm. at the time and that was hard because um, Stonewall was opposing uh, fight for marriage equality. They were saying, we're perfectly happy with civil partnerships. They're just great. Um, but Peter Tatchell saw the inequality um, in having two separate but parallel institutions and backed us to fight for equality along the way. And also he provided um, flair i suppose yeah. you'd say in the way we we approach the whole campaigning thing liberty yeah. wanted us to be very sober and respectable and and not annoy anyone particularly not annoy the judge yeah and and peter was keen that we should do theatrics so you know turn up in court in two bridal dresses <laughs> we, we, we didn't but <laughs> so we had to balance those two but actually peter and um, the others at Outrage taught us a lot about media strategies mm. and how we could actually present ourselves and think about the camp campaign in a way that might attract the media and be of interest to the media. So, so tell me more about how you approached your media strategy and what you thought the risks were and what you were trying to avoid and what you were trying to get them to focus on. So Liberty put out a press release and we were very involved in writing that press release and we made sure that it focused on human rights aspects. Um, so that was important to get the press release right in the first place. And that did take some negotiation, didn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. I think there was a, a I mean, it was, it was our marriage and it was our struggle. So we got to say what went in it, but there was a sort of presumption or a, or a perception from some people at Liberty that the way to kind of win hearts and minds might be to say how much we loved each other. Oh yes, we had to be <laughs> in love. <laughs> and how, love is love. Yeah, love is love, that kind of message. And that, that we were no different from straight people and that we were heartbroken and devastated that our marriage was not being recognized. And they were, everybody was very disappointed in our wedding photos, weren't they? They really had hope for two bridal dresses or a groom and bride effect or, you know, whatever. And, and we had a very low key, very low key civil wedding in, in a registrar's conservatory in in Vancouver so so you know we, we didn't deliver if you like on the kind of romantic story about marriage and and in that sense I think for liberty we were a disappointment um, and I thought we would be for the media but in fact I was really surprised how straightforwardly we seemed able to communicate the unfairness of the fact that had we been a man and a woman and got married in Canada and come back to England, our marriage would have been recognized as such. And because we were two women, it wasn't. We were stripped of our marriage. And I think that central message of unfairness, it cut through, is marriage a good thing or not? Because it didn't matter, we were already married. So, you know, that wasn't, should gay people get married was no longer the point. We were married and then we were having it taken away and a, and a straight couple wouldn't have had that done. So I think the media was, it, it, it didn't feel difficult to get the media on board. Actually. No, I mean, we were surprised that they all seemed to pick up that central message, although we did bang on about it quite a lot. <laughs> um, and also that we didn't get negative co coverage. Hmm. You know, we, we, we thought that there would be, particularly in the, the tabloids, the sort of this is disgusting, how could lesbians expect to be treated the same as heterosexuals, that sort of stuff, but it, it didn't happen. 
So we did get from Don Horrocks of the Evangelical Christian Alliance, group, Alliance. Yes. Um, the, a very sort of hostile response. I think the media kind of looked for some people who would be opposed. And, and, and his comment was, um, to marry a, one woman, marry another woman. Why, you might as well marry your horse. <laughs> um, at, but, but that was carefully balanced by a whole lot of other Christian groups um, saying that's disgusting, that's offensive, that is uncharitable, that is unchristian. So I think the media actually struggled to find people who'd, who'd oppose it um, yeah. because it just seemed common sense. Yeah, and it was so nice to see even the tabloids saying things like marriage is a human right. Yeah, we felt headline, that was a headline, was a headline. In, in one of the tabloids, wasn't yeah. it? Marriage is a human right, say lesbians, or something, <laughs> you know. Um, they, they mostly did pick up on that central message of equality and human rights. And that, I mean, we also got very aware of the different segments of the media from, from the tabloids through to I guess at the top end, the sort of legal correspondence, like Joshua Rosenberg, who did a detailed interview with us, and also the different kinds of media from news reports through to kind of in-depth features about, you know, how did how all of it had gone. And so there were a range of different mm. interviews that we were doing. And we were kind of surprised at the extent of media interest. I mean, oh, we I did issue press releases, but we were mm. not prepared for the fact that one Saturday morning yes. there was a knock on the door. And I think it was me went down to answer it in my pajamas. And there was uh, <laughs> the local newspaper saying, can we have an interview, please? So, uh, yeah, and I this is shut the door and, and said, you can make an appointment to have an interview when I'm dressed, but not now. Not <laughs> and this was in the days before <laughs> social media or, and kind of um, the kind of resources that we have now for getting stuff around quickly. So um, I think now one would manage a media campaign very differently, yeah. having access to things like Twitter and, and Zoom and, and all the rest. But but. Yeah, so it was then people with video cameras. There was definitely yeah. a video camera. Yeah. It wasn't just a print yeah. journalism. Um, then it was people turning up and expecting to, to see you. I'm thinking of you both in bridal dresses and both in pajamas <laughs> <laughs> in the press. You got a line at both. So how did you dress? How did you present yourself visually when you were being photographed or filmed? Uh, well, we went <laughs> very much with the Liberty model of respectability. So we had, um, when we first appeared in court, we had sort of not quite matching neat gray suits with pink blouses underneath. And um, then when we actually had the judgment, that, that was quite fun in a way because we knew in advance that we were very unlikely to win our case. So we prepared for, for losing it. And we had, I don't know whether you can see this image, very clearly. Oh yes, very nice. Head so that's us on the steps of the High Court. Yes. We practiced walking down there <laughs> hand in hand, wearing our black suits, looking downcast. Um, you know, the exit from the court was and a, you wrote a, a piece of performance. Yeah, and, and I had a statement prepared, which I then read out to the media. Um, but we were occasionally ambushed by bizarre things like I got, found this one looking through um, because I think we had very few indications of our marriage, like wedding photos. We did. We did. And we do wear wedding rings. And that is an image. Is that visible? Yes, it is. You must send that one to me of our hands, very close up with hands with wedding rings. Um, and I just remember thinking, I haven't cleaned my fingernails. Oh my goodness, <laughs> I'd have made my fingernails look better if I'd known. Um, so, so, you know, an attempt to get the symbolism of marriage for, for us was quite challenging. And I think the rings, the rings were one way of doing that. Um, we actually wore rings for that reason, didn't we? Um, we chose, we did choose. I mean, they're Canadian rings with Canadian imagery on, but, but um, we also took our rings off when we lost the case um, and we put them on again when we went on holiday to countries where same-sex marriage was recognized. And then we would take them off again when we came back to England 
um, because we were only civil partners. So we, it was very nice actually when our, our marriage was recognized in England to put them on and not have to take them off again. And we had a little, little ceremony with champagne of to do that. <laughs> Were any of your concerns about risks realised? I remember one or two concerns about media coverage. I remember being on the steps of, of the uh, court and being told to um, sort of mind my father, our father, Celia, and what he might say. I don't know if you remember that or you have any other... Yes. He had a tendency to make really bad jokes, including, I think, a joke about horses after the um, Don Horrocks. <laughs> when he saw... When he saw you, Sue, he did not to tease. So, uh, yes, I was quite anxious about how he would talk to the media. And I think I did ask you to please keep him away from the media. But, well, you know what happened because I wasn't there. Well, it was lovely in that, um, that the media did spot him and, and came to us. And I was desperately trying to kind of stop him talking. But um, he was magnificent. He rose to the occasion and talked about... The, the Nazis and what they had done to try and disown his parents' marriage and uh, under Nazism. And he had fought against the idea that anyone could do that to his parents and was shocked and horrified by that. And he was equally shocked and horrified that any government would do that to his daughter's marriage to Sue. So he pulled that out of a hat. And I think it was quoted in, was it just the Jewish Chronicle picked it up or something, mm -hmm. some outlet did. Yeah. But it was a, a lovely moment where I thought, yeah, yeah. yeah I think one of the issues around this kind of media strategy is you can't control for other people's reactions. So um, I was worried about people at work, for example. And in fact, they were worried at the university about being seen to be kind of supporting the campaign for same sex marriage. Um, and I was asked by my head of department to come and talk about that um, during the time that it was going through court and they agreed the statement that they would make is that I was employed by them, but they had nothing to do with this, basically. I was doing this in my spare time. Um, so, so people around you do feel, you can't control what happens around you, but, but if, you in, if you go through a media campaign, and I think this is particularly pertinent actually in, in subsequent media campaigns for couples with children and couples with parents who weren't necessarily on board, or um, for people with, with um, yeah, relatives with, with differing views. Um, we were free in a sense to do this campaign because of the kind of um, experiences and background and freedoms of academia that, that liberated us to do that. I think the other thing that's really striking when I look at the media coverage and, and remembering it at the time was there was a certain kind of coverage before the court case, but then because of the judge's statement, you really you really flushed out some rather sexism <laughs> that I think then re-energized and maybe made gay and lesbians who are maybe a bit hesitant about marriage think, hold on a minute, if that's the reason for not giving us marriage, we bloody well do want it. So I wonder if you want to say a bit about that. Yes, he, he offered us this beautiful quote about um, marriage is, is respected and respectable and I can't remember it now, has been for generations or something. Yes. yes. And means of and procreation of children and bringing them up in the nuclear family. Um, so, you know, it was like a hand grenade that you could lob at anyone who said, why do you want marriage? It was like, well, <laughs> if this is what marriage they think marriage is you know that isn't what marriage is for most people um so this is working to a very old-fashioned notion of marriage and of course that was very widely quoted yeah and and particularly he indicated that um for the purpose of um article 8 of of the human rights act um we are not a family yeah and that was something that really galvanized people who hadn't supported us before, you know, yes. how dare they say we are not a family. And, and that excludes us from a key human right, the right yeah. to family life. I think you've talked about it was quite a simple and easy message for the media to get. It was you two, it was unfair. You'd been, you were married in Canada. Of course your marriage should be recognized. It did strike me that the coverage of you back in 2006 was in some ways more positive 
than the coverage of the consultation around marriage in 2012, for example, where there were far more critical discussions about marriage. And is that because yours was a fairly, you know, it was you two. You just wanted your marriage recognised. It was, it was only just, it was only right, as opposed to the more abstract yeah. consultation in 2012, when they could pull up arguments about what the majority wanted or... I think by then the whole issue was much more in the public consciousness. I mean, I, I, one of the things I think we did was to start debates going and to raise awareness of the issues. There just wasn't that sort of focus on the institution and what it meant back or, in, in there. Or on, or on the idea that... that the difference in 2020 for me was that civil partnerships were well established. Like, what more do they want? Give them an inch and they'll take a mile. In civil partnerships, why do they need marriage? It was a step too far, was the kind of thing. So I think once civil partnerships were there, and it, it, it felt like it felt like an extra an extra ask to go on and get marriage. Although I think something else that had changed then is a lot of people had attended weddings civil partnership weddings yeah. <laughs> the effect of the party the effect of being there throwing the confetti it yeah. became a kind of badge of kind of being a bit trendy to yeah, yeah. A civil partnership ceremony i.e a wedding so weddings seem to have their own momentum which i think encouraged the move to yes gay marriage equality in a bizarre way you would never kind of have wanted but it did seem to work that way is there anything you would have done differently looking back? Well, I wish we could have pushed it further through the courts mm. um, because having lost the High Court case, there was, of course, possibility we could appeal the judgment, but we were simply unable to because the costs would have been prohibitive um, and we did approach high profile media yes. figures asking if they would support our case and back us financially. And it was just no. So and one, one very interesting um, development was that we asked Elton John mm -hmm. and he was going, no, no, no. Civil partnerships are absolutely fine. Um, no need for marriage whatsoever. But of course, as soon as it was possible for same-sex couples to marry, what did he do? He went and got married. <laughs> did you send him a bill at that point? Uh, I think we held our peace. <laughs> I, I do think it's very interesting that there was so much resistance to marriage from within the gay and particularly the lesbian community and feminist groups during the time that we were seeking marriage rights and that now you can't really imagine feminists and lesbian and gay groups being anti-same-sex marriage as an available option, even if you don't want it for yourself. Um, it's very hard to see how people who occupy those, those positions as lesbian, gay, feminist, liberals could oppose having the institution of marriage available to same-sex couples as well as to different sex couples. I can't quite work out why back then they thought it was okay to oppose that, but they did. Mm. No, it's been a massive change. Is there anything else I should be asking you about the media or your media strategies? I think the only thing I would say is that since then I've been involved in other media strategies on other things, as you know, mm -hmm. with you, <laughs> on issues around death, dying, coma, liminal states. Um, and I'm just very aware of how media, some of the skills are transferable in terms of thinking about hooks that the media can use. Other things have changed out of all recognition with the move from print to whatever you call it, online, media and social media and stuff so you know it makes me think in a way how did you manage media strategies in the 20s or the 40s or the 50s and that these are these are evolving strategies and somebody somewhere in media studies must have researched that but um it's interesting to have felt a part of changing media strategies in that way yes yes 
And do you still use your your platform as two women who are at the forefront of challenging unequal access to marriage back in 2006 in relation to other kinds of inequalities that still exist specifically around marriage such as such as immigration yes we've 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 been asked mm. sometimes ex exactly to do that by people saying there are i think immigration was one wasn't it mm. um that's that, that there are inequalities in marriage that still exist um, in relation to people with disabilities, in relation to immigration, um, and in relation to, there was another one recently, I um, can't remember what it was, and, and as, as people who have fought their own marriage, for their own marriage rights, can we write about that for this, the other organisation, and we have, we have done that. Uh, I think also there's a sort of um, development of a, a history of protest, which is very interesting, whereby you people want to construct a history of how things happened and what was done. And so we're regularly asked in Lesbian and Gay History Month, for example, to write stuff about what we did and why we did it and when, um, and sort of a, appropriated <laughs> by Reading University, where I did my PhD recently, like, you're one of our alumni, will you write that how you you contributed to this big change um, for yeah. this yeah. game? And, um, and you're an asset to a university, whereas before they were trying to keep you at arm's length. But... Well, yes, and you can see that, and it's a very bittersweet thing to experience that. Um, so y University of York, which asked not to be associated with us during the time of the court hearing at the point when same-sex marriage was legislated for in this country um, paid for a celebration involving a wedding cake and fake wedding invitations balloons and balloons and, champagne. and, champ and yeah. I think it was Prosecco but um, <laughs> oh. um, just to, for your for the University of York to have an impact event celebrating the contribution that York staff had made not just me other people too to to same-sex marriage extraordinary yeah so there's an appropriation of what we have achieved um as as part of a new myth of other people's involvement in creating that change but i think also we we do have a tiny corner in history i mean it's quite nice to be asked for instance to go and give a talk to law students which we've done a number of times as litigants so, you know, we can talk about what the experience was like of bringing a case mm. from the litigants perspective, as well as reflecting on how the law has actually changed. As we can talk to your students about what it's like to try and influence the media yeah. in a campaign direction that you care about, um, because, because we did. That is terrific. Thank you very much for making time of an evening. I shall let you get back to your coffee and chocolates. <laughs> <laughs> chocolates? What chocolates? <laughs>